BDD is at the heart of my preferred approach to software development. It adds significant value in a number of different ways. But it's easy to miss the point and so end up with less value than you otherwise could. Here are some of my thoughts on how BDD really helps and I'll finish up with five ways that teams often miss the point and so miss the value. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, Specflow and Linode. They're all helping us to develop our channel, so please do help them in turn by checking out their links in the description below. Uh, I have two new online courses coming soon that address different aspects of automated testing and BDD. Sign up to my email list for discounts on the courses and for news of their release. There's more to BDD than meets the eye. It's not just about calling tests specifications and writing those specifications in Gherkin with Specflow or Cucumber. You can do BDD without doing any of these things, and doing these things doesn't mean that you're doing BDD. For me, the core idea here is that we aim to separate the specification of our systems from their implementation. We want to describe what we'd like our system to do without saying anything at all about how it does it, as far as we can at least. If we can do this, we gain some huge advantages. It means that we need to be able to describe clearly what our system needs to do. So we need to collaborate with people who understand the problem that we're working on. We need to record what we learn from these collaborations in a way that helps us to steer our development efforts effectively. So we need to establish a way of describing our needs. It would be nice if when we expressed a need like that, we could talk about it in a fairly consistent way. You could think of this consistent way as a kind of domain-specific language that allows us to express ideas of what our software should do. It would be wonderful if every time we described what we'd like our software to do, we used our domain-specific language in a consistent way. You may think of this as a kind of ubiquitous language for expressing those ideas in our problem domain. I'm sure that the domain-driven designers won't mind too much. If we described what we'd like our system to do in a domain-specific language like that, we could then think of some examples that demonstrate that our system did actually do what we wanted it to. If our language was consistent, we could automate it. We could use it to describe those, these examples in a way that defines the outcomes that we're aiming for, creating executable specifications for what we're aiming to achieve. If we then guide our development from those specifications, we're much less likely to miss our target. We're less likely to lose focus and build the wrong thing. More subtly, we're now guiding our development directly from user need rather than a more task-based decomposition of detailed development jobs. This means that it's a lot easier to track our progress, Easier to understand the context in which the changes that we make make sense. Easier to come up with better, more innovative answers that are more likely to meet the needs of our users. When we get these things right, BDD goes a very, very long way to improving the quality of our work. But it doesn't always work out like that. Why not? Well, here are five common reasons. Common mistake number one is confusing UI interactions with behaviour. Here's an example. I see tests that look like this all of the time. In fact, I'd say this is probably the commonest form of test written in Gherkin that I see. My first problem with this is that it isn't really a specification at all. It's a design. This doesn't say what the user wants. It only says what we'll give them. I upgraded my computer recently. My new one has fingerprint recognition. So most of the time now when I want to access something secure, I don't enter Dave into the username field and password123 password into the password field. I touch my finger and I'm in. So this requirement is wrong from my perspective and my perspective matters here because I'm the user. This specification doesn't describe what I'm doing or what I want. 
Now, you could argue that my example here breaks down a little bit because the applications that I'm using probably still have a username and password field, but that's not what I use as a user. I'm pretty sure that this approach too is to authorization is going to change in future. A behavioral specification would be very different. It would be simpler and it would be more general, allowing us to meet the specification that it represents in a variety of different ways, now with the username and in future with, I don't know, thought controlled proof of identity. This is no less right than the previous one. It's no less accurate in capturing the impact or usefulness to the user. In fact, it's more accurate. It says that Scott can access his accounts rather than lands on a home page, which is another irrelevant leak of implementation detail. We could argue about the use of the term login rather than the more technically correct authorize, but even so, it's still true whether we implement a fingerprint recognition system, face recognition, voice activation, or thought control. This change is a much better description of the behavior that we want. It also leaves the development team free to innovate and solve the problem in whatever way makes most sense to them at the time. So this means that their interpretation of this requirement, the implementation that they create to fulfill it, can change over time. With a stronger validation that when we do switch from password control to mind control, the change is a behavior preserving implementation detail rather than a change in requirements. My advice is to always aim to write specifications that say nothing at all about how your system works. Test this by imagining the specification being fulfilled by a completely different system, even if it is a crazy thought controlled one. As I said, this mistake is the most common that I see, but it's only one version of a more general mistake, testing implementation and not specifying behavior. This is a symptom of a bigger mistake, I think, that I call attempting programming by remote control. This often happens when organizations don't really trust development teams to solve a problem. So instead, they get some more senior people, sometimes even non-technical senior people, to specify exactly what the development team should do. Sometimes programmers are complicit in this, demanding detailed step-by-step -step instructions for every change. I think this is a big mistake. Our job as software developers is not typing code. It's solving problems with software. If you think that your job is only typing code, I'd recommend that you take a look at what GitHub's AI-based Copilot can do at the moment. It may make you nervous about your job. Typing code isn't our job, but confusing requirements with solution starts to marginalize what it is that we do and what our real job is, and locks us into often overly simple or overly complex solutions. It ends up with the reasons, the context in which we are working, getting lost on their way to us, so we're unlikely to do a great job. I don't think that you can do a really great job in software development unless you understand the problem that you're trying to solve. You don't get to understand the problem if the requirements only say things like put a button here or add a service there. Good BDD scenarios are concise and clear, which brings us to the next common problem, long running scenarios. Here's an example. There's quite a lot going on here. But what's gone wrong is that whoever wrote this real specification was thinking of it as some kind of test rather than as a specification. They were probably also thinking something like, it's taken me all this time to get to this point, so may, I may as well try everything that I can think of while I'm here. This makes the test fragile. A tiny change will invalidate it. It obscures the real requirements by hiding it in a morass of largely irrelevant, inconsequential detail. The detail is the job of unit testing. It's easy to mistake BDD scenarios for tests. I often refer to them as acceptance tests, but their real job is to define the behavior that we want from our system, to act as an executable specification that will guide our development, and then only later verify, test, that our system meets its specifications. The real behavior that we're looking for in this example is pretty simple. Um, when I update the bus, the bus has been changed. 
Let's just say something like that. My advice is to aim to have each scenario validate a single outcome. I borrowed some of these real world examples in this episode from John Ferguson Smart, for which I'm very grateful. He has a really nice suggestion for checking that you have your specifications right. Can you imagine your specification working as an example in the documentation of your system? One of our sponsors, Specflow, has some useful stuff on learning BDD on their site. I've put a link in the description below so you can take a look. A more technical failing that I often see, mainly with people coding scenarios in Gherkin, is that there's no reuse. They don't reuse the steps in their, in their specifications. This says two things. They're wasting time and effort implementing nearly every spec from scratch, but perhaps even more importantly, they're thinking about this wrong. I can't imagine a system where there is no reuse in these scenarios. If I'm specifying a system that allows me to order books, there are going to be lots of reasons to place an order for a book, to explore uh, the different angles in book buying. If I'm developing a flight control system, I'm going to be very interested in being able to specify lots of different combinations of speed, height, weight, alti attitude, angle of attack, and so on. I think that what it really means, if you don't see a need for reuse, is that you're not thinking in terms of the problem domain you're probably back in the realms of coding by remote control. So I guess that what I'm really saying here is that the solution focus of coding by remote control is the fundamental evil. One of the big wins of BDD is that it makes the need to establish a language that describes the problems that we aim to fix more obvious. And if we want to make our specifications executable, it encourages us to regularize that language into an executable form and make it ubiquitous so we use it everywhere. My advice is to grasp this opportunity with both hands and consciously work to make a domain-specific language that you can use to define scenarios that exercise your system and steer your development. Then use it to make writing and implementing BDD scenarios easy. I confess that I prefer internal DSLs, DSLs built on top of my programming language for this job. But you can do this very effectively in Gherkin 2. I think of this as a four layer approach to your test code, which is equally applicable whether you're doing an internal DSL or an external DSL along the Gherkin kind of model. The test cases focused are focused on what the system needs to do. The DSL layer defining that, the language that is used in those test cases and providing some other helpful tools along the way. The protocol drivers which translate between ideas in the language of the problem domain expressed in the DSL and the system under test um, gives us the, the, the glue between our tests and the system that we're evaluating. My final common failing is also taken from John Ferguson Smart's excellent presentation. Uh, I'll put a link in the description again. He calls it scenario overload. This is often caused by people using BDD as the only form of automated testing for their system. Or when these BDD scenarios are left to a QA team to write and maintain separately from a development team. In both of these cases, the people writing the tests try to make sure that every possible case is covered. That's not really the job of these specifications. All of the parts of the name matter in behavior-driven development. Software development driven by focusing on the desired behavior of the system. We want high-level executable specifications that drive our development process from the outside in based on a laser focus on the desirable behaviours that we'd like our system to exhibit. It's not our aim to test every conceivable input to our systems here. Executable specifications work best in combinations with other forms of automated testing, so try to avoid over-testing in BDD scenarios. My preferred approach to BDD is to deploy my software into a production-like test environment that runs a series of realistic scenarios that demonstrate the behavior of the system from the perspective of an external user of it. These are often complex tests, so they're probably not great for testing tiny differences like this. 
much better to design your code so that you can test these tiny differences in unit tests. I think that BDD is a powerful tool to drive high quality development, but you do need to avoid the bear traps along the way and keep focused on what, not how. Thank you very much for watching.